So I'd like to introduce you to Stephen Grabner. He is the president of OCI, as well as the uh, lay pastor of East Ridge SDA Church and missionary extraordinaire. So we're going to get to know him a little better and ask him some questions about mission work and how we as young people and adults can better get on fire for mission work. Yes, you do get a microphone. All right. So first question, uh, just tell us a little bit uh, about your early life. What was the kind of culture and family that you grew up with in your younger years, and what was, what's your background like? Um, so I... So I grew up in a Jewish family, north of New York City, um, Westchester County, little kind of rural area. Um, went to synagogue every Sabbath and went to Hebrew school three times in the week, Sunday morning, Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. So that was my, my background and culture. My entire family is Jewish. Uh, and so as a follow-up question, people ask, well, do you still consider yourself Jewish? Yes, uh, I am Jewish by birth, by blood. So no matter what I do in my life, that's not going to change. All right. I'm Jewish too. Did you know that? I didn't. I am. Really, I am. That's why you're so smart. Well... All right, so let's jump to your college age, uh, that time of your life. Um, what were your goals at that time? What were you planning on? Was going into the mission work, mission field, something that was in the back of your mind, or what was your goals at that time? <clears throat> so at college, no. Going into the mission field was not in the back of my mind. Again, I was raised in a, in a secular environment. Um, actually, it was about 52 years ago last week that my father went into the hospital for a fairly... Well, for an examination, he had a heart arrhythmia, and when he was in the hospital, they were doing a procedure, and they accidentally um, inserted a catheter and punctured his heart and killed him in the hospital. Um, and so that really kind of like overturned my life. And so after I was bar mitzvahed, which is a very significant event in the Jewish faith, well, a couple of years after my bar mitzvah, I kind of just drifted away from my Jewish faith. And in high school and in college, my goal was to get high. That was pretty much my goal in life. And I was doing very well at it. Um, I had some unusual friends in college. There was a fellow, we called him Rasputin. He was really, really very big and very unusual. I remember coming into his room one time and he was laying on his bed and he had a stack of quarters, uh, you know, about two or three dollars worth of quarters on his forehead. And this was who I hung out with. And uh, he was trying to levitate the quarters off of his forehead. And he came and said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm levitating the quarters. Oh, cool. So I sat down and I was kind of watching him. Not a lot happening, but I was watching him. And all of a sudden, another friend of ours came into the room, and he, his face was kind of just lit up. And I'm like, what happened to you? And he said, well, he was hitchhiking, coming back to the school, and he got picked up by a Christian. Christian shared his faith with him, and when the, the Christian dropped him off, he was like, oh, that's nonsense. In his backpack, he had some illegal narcotics. And about five minutes later, a police vehicle drove up, officer got out and began to search his backpack. And he prayed. He said, God, if, if, if what that man has told me is true, help this policeman not to find it. It's not a great prayer, but he prayed it. And the policeman didn't find his illegal drugs. So he surrendered to Christ. He threw his drugs away, and he yielded his life to Christ. And he came into the dorm room, and and as he was telling the story, Rasputin sat up. All the quarters went flying every place. Um, and they began to argue. And I said to him, said to Rasputin, I said, well, I don't know if he's telling the truth or not, but what he has is much better than what you have. And um, then he looked at me, and he says, you're going to be a Christian one day. And it, it might be hard for you to grasp, but to be a Christian said to a Jew, a person from a Jewish family, is very offensive. It's the Jews, from the Jewish perspective rather, it's the Christians 
who have persecuted the Jews. You know, all the pogroms and, you know, Christ killers and all these different historical events. And so it was really, gave me the creeps. So no, my goal was not in any way to be a missionary at that point in time. I was really just trying to figure out what life was like. All right. So what was the point? What, what did get you into mission work? Where, where did that transition happen? So I ended up dropping out of school. Uh, don't recommend that. Um, but I ended up dropping out of school. I went to Israel, spent some time there, worked on a kibbutz, and studied Hebrew. Um, and, and while I was there, I met, lo and behold, some Christians. And we traveled around Israel together. And I remember one of them, his, his name was Fred. Um, he, when we were in Jerusalem, he looked across the street and there was a guy there who looked kind of emaciated. The word I would use back then was wasted. I don't know if that resonates with anybody. But um, he looked really wasted. And my friend said, if you're not careful, that's what's going to happen to you. And I said, no, 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 no. But when he said that, the Holy Spirit started speaking to my heart. Came back from Israel. And I was, became a vegetarian, and I was back in my hometown, and a group of Seventh-day Adventist lay people had started a vegetarian restaurant. And so I used to frequent the restaurant. And while I was there, I became very, uh, I was drawn to their Christianity, to who they were. So I asked them if I could move in with them. And I wanted to start a restaurant like that in New York City. And they said, well, you have to move in with us. And so I did, and as I moved in, again, my hair was quite long and my beard was much longer and darker. Um, and, but when I moved in with them, they started sharing. Um, I used to sit in the corner while they had worship. I would meditate in the corner or go outside in the trees and meditate. And they began to share different things, um, Adventist perspective on things. And one of the things they really shared, uh, um, well, there were several issues that came up. And so I began to pray which was unusual for me, but I began to pray. And so I had three prayers. I had a girlfriend that was an atheist at the time, and she probably still is, we've lost contact, but I had a girlfriend, and so I prayed, God, if you're real, somehow work in her life. And then um, I could tell that what Jesus said about sin and righteousness was different than what other religious faiths taught. So I knew that, that what Jesus said was different. If it was true, it demanded a response. So I prayed, well, Lord, I need to know, if the, or God, I need to know if this is true. And then um, I had a third prayer that had to do with Orion's nebula. Ellen White describes the holy city coming down from Orion. And I wanted to see scientific confirmation of that. So it was December 24th. I was at a friend's house. A group of us were sitting around. Everybody was um, smoking an illegal substance. I wasn't because I had a sore throat, but a friend of mine gave some to me. He wrapped it up in tin foil, gave it to me, and so I put it on a nightstand, and I was flipping through this magazine, flipping and talking, and music was playing, and I started looking at this picture and talking and looking, and lo and behold, the picture was a scientific, uh, a, an artistic depiction from scientific information about Orion's nebula. And it was like this long, dark tunnel and a bright light at the end and all these colors. And I was like, wow, look at that. That was really impressive to me. And then when I got up to leave, I went to take the illegal substance, and it was gone. And there were only four or five of us in the room, all friends. And I, it's gone. And I said to my friend, maybe God doesn't want me to have that. And he became very agitated, and he started swearing. And he, he, I was sitting on a bed. He threw me off the bed, and he picked up the mattress, and he looked for it, and he never found it. We never found it. Uh, then on the way home, my girlfriend and I were driving, and she asked the question, um, why would Satan hate Christ so much? And before I could answer, before I could start to tell the answer that the Adventists had told me, she started talking about the war in heaven. And it just amazed me. She just kind of like was unfolding the great controversy theme. We went back to my mother's house. Everybody was gone. And we opened the Bible to Daniel chapter 9 and started kind of describing what I had been told about Daniel 9. And all of a sudden, the light went on mentally, and I could see that Jesus was the Messiah. The sanctuary service, Abraham and Isaac, 
Isaiah chapter 53, Daniel chapter 9, Jesus is the Messiah. And so I surrendered. And that was a very big, clearly, turning point in my life. So how did you go from that point to then what got you interested in missions? Well, I was working at this vegetarian restaurant. Um, and my time there was about up. I was going away to college. I had already applied to go to college. I went to college and, you know, in Colorado, and I knew that the Sabbath was Saturday. I knew that from my Jewish background. And I knew that the dead were asleep. I knew that from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Those were my two pieces of information. And so I started going to lots of different churches and studying um, and eventually became convicted that just that God was using the Jewish people in you know, biblical times, God's using the Seventh-day Adventist church today. So I was baptized. Uh, and so I quit school again, twice, um, quit school again, and decided to get involved in ministry. Some friends of mine were involved in a, a project that was lay-led, self-supporting. And so they invited me to come work there. That led to me moving to New York City and helping found several restaurants in New York City that were evangelistic in nature. And then from there, I was called into pastoral ministry. All right. So what would you say to young people that are in high school or looking to start college that they're, you know, they have career choices ahead of them, life choices ahead of them, and you know, but maybe they have mission work on their mind or they're not sure what to do, or how to decide or how to balance the two. What tips would you give to them about serving God, but also trying to decide what to do with their life if they're not sure? Yeah, so that's really clearly a huge question. A number of years ago, when my daughter graduated from high school, she asked her aunt to give the, um, the what do you call those addresses at the end? Commencement address? Yeah. So the commencement address at the high school, and this happened to be Mark Finley's sister, uh, my daughter's aunt. And so her topic, she was 50 at the time, the title of her talk was, What I Want to Do When I Grow Up. She's 50. And, you know, I think too often, you know, we look for this, and maybe some people get it, silver bullet in life where everything's crystal clear. Most people that I've met, that's not really the case. You know, God unfolds things to us step by step. Um, God wants to use whatever talents we might have. In the book, Education, I believe it's page 267, Ellen White gives a very powerful rules for choosing an occupation in life. And they're very simple and yet very hard. And the three rules are commit yourself to God, do the best at what's right in front of you, and watch for the indications of his providence. Of the three, which is the hardest? Watch for the indications? I don't think so. I think the most difficult is doing the best with what's right in front of you. We're very easy to look around for indications of providence, just like the boat going to Tarshish was a providence for Jonah, going the wrong direction. You know, we're, we're constantly looking for providence, but to surrender every day and then do your best what's in front of you and believe that God's going to continue to lead you step by step and to watch for a providence. So, you know, for everybody here, young and old, to me, that's just a tremendously powerful, life-forming counsel. Surrender, do your best at what's right in front of you, and watch for providence. And believe that God's interested in you. And something I free say frequently to people is, you know, God's not surprised by the fact that you're on planet Earth, and God is more interested in guiding you than you are in being led. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Sometimes, you know, we pray, oh, I'm not getting an answer. Believe that God is more interested in guiding you, and that he will in his time and his way. But use your gifts, your talents, your abilities. Try to grow them as much as you can so that you can use them for service. So bring us up to speed where you are now. What, <clears throat> what are you up to these days? What, are, what mission work are you involved in? Where all have you traveled to? How many countries have you been to? Uh, how many countries? Around 70, um, which is really low. I met somebody who has 101. So now I'm kind of motivated to start traveling. Uh, so I work with an organization called OCI. 
It, the name of the organization is Outpost Centers International. It's one of the things I do. I'm president of that organization. And it's an organization that supports lay missionaries, self-supporting workers all around the world. We have about 124 ministries in 44 different countries. And our vision is to see in every country of the world a thriving network of lay people active in service. The gospel is supposed to go all around the world, right? No, no, no. And, you know, everywhere. And so wherever the gospel goes, there should be Seventh-day Adventists. And wherever there are Seventh-day Adventists, there should be Seventh-day Adventist lay people engaged in ministry. And one of our greatest hindrances for our church as a whole is that we have a paid segment of the church which is doing a good work. No, I'm not talking negatively against that. Pastors, educators, medical workers, wonderful. But that's a very small percentage of church members. And God's calling all of us to be engaged in ministry in some way. So it's my privilege to go around the world to uh, help these new ministries get started, both in the United States and overseas. And it's really exciting what's happening in China and in Indonesia, in Jakarta, a strongly Muslim country. There's some women that have started four restaurants, uh, health food stores rather, and above the health food stores, they have a doctor's office, and above that they have a church um, in you know, Muslim Jakarta, Jewish, doing tremendous work. South America, Africa, in Russia, work is growing tremendously with your lay people, in the Philippines, in Thailand. It's just thrilling to see what God will do with anybody that's willing to put themselves into service. Amen. So in addition to that, I volunteer as a pastor of Eastridge, and I get the privilege of teaching at Southern in the fall with SALT. All right. And in closing, now, <clears throat> we know you're a very smart and intelligent man, and that, you know... Do you I'm want sure... something from me? <laughs> no, no. And that I'm sure mission work can be tiring and exhausting sometimes. I'm sure there could easily be a career that you could be working here in the States that's easier, more comforting, that you could probably make more money in. What would you say that makes it all worthwhile, and to me, speaking to some of us that may be struggling with the decision of mission work and, you know, a comfort life, comfortable life here versus working for God, you know, anywhere we are or anywhere we go? Yeah, that's a great question. Everybody has to answer that clearly for themselves. Um, Abraham was very wealthy and yet was a missionary. So there's not necessarily a correlation between being having hardships and being a missionary or being well off financially and being a missionary. Abraham certainly was. But regardless with Abraham's wealth, he left, you know, Ur the Chaldees, which was a very comfortable city. And they had indoor plumbing, just, you know, a real nice place to live. But Abraham sensed God's call, heard God's call in his life. And, and we need to do the same thing. Years ago, before I was a Christian, I worked in New York City hanging wallpaper. Um, I hung wallpaper in the World Trade Centers and different things like that. And, and I remember, and I was making quite a lot of money at that time, particularly in those days. And I remember just really wondering that, you know, what's life all about? And for me, just making a living wasn't enough. Um, some of you are aware that last year uh, there was a misdiagnosis and I was misdiagnosed with liver cancer. I was given six months to live and fortunately it was a misdiagnosis. I'm fine, happy, healthy. But, yeah, amen. Um, but when you think you only have six months left to live, it puts certain things in perspective. And for me, I was really thrilled that I lived my life in service. You know, I could look back and I could say, yeah, I've made a lot of mistakes. I don't have the biggest bank account. I'm not poverty stricken. But at least I lived my life trying to bless other people. And if you live a life like that, yeah, then there's no regrets. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us here and for giving us your insights. If you'd like to talk to him more or have questions about being a missionary with his organization or otherwise, uh, he'll be around to talk to you afterwards. And thank you for coming. My pleasure.